mountains are still being moved. Strongholds are still being loosed. God, we believe it. Yes, we can see that. Wonders are still what you do. We are here for you. Good morning and welcome to worship today. We are glad you are here. We are glad that you've chosen to worship with us, whether you are here in person today or if you are worshiping with us online. Um, we're, we're very happy to be worshiping together. And as we begin our time of worship this morning, will you join me in prayer? Lord, we are indeed grateful for your presence in this place. We know that you are here, and we know that you want to work in this place. We know you want to work in our lives, and you want to work in the life of this church. Help us, Lord, just to, just to be still, to quiet our minds and the things that might be distracting us, and to just be attentive to your spirit, to be attentive to the way that you are moving. Um, May the things that are in our hearts and in our minds and the words that are on our mouths honor and glorify you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to be singing the two hymns from our hymnal, which is, uh, if you are curious on the numbers, it's 348 and 349. It's entitled, My Savior's Love and Oh How He Loves You and Me. And if you feel like you want to join us, you please do so. My Savior's Love and Oh How He Loves You and Me.
There's one day of the year when love is celebrated in abundance. Big red hearts passed to all of our friends, bags of the best chocolate consumed by the pound, cards, candy, nice meals, surprise gifts. It's lavish and lovely and reminds us of all the good things. But what does love look like when it spills to every other day of the year? Maybe it's food banks always stocked, hard conversations over hot cups of coffee, holding the hand of a stranger, sticking it out through hard times, sitting in grief, it's not even yours, delivering hope through a simple card, laughter and goodwill, provision, protection, patience, forgiveness before it's asked, walking a mile in another's shoes. We know this kind of love because we saw it. Love is the son willing to hang on the cross, the God willing to die in our place, the father who had a plan to save his children from the moment he created us. We were always on his heart and still are every day of the year. I don't know if you caught that introduction there, but it said, what would it look like if love spilled out to every day of the year? And that's a great question to ponder. Maybe if you, <clears throat> this week, or in the past couple of weeks, maybe you've had an opportunity to share some love with someone, maybe a neighbor or a friend, um, maybe in giving, or maybe in being present to someone else. Uh, what if our love spilled out every day of the year? Because we have been given much, we too must give. And so that is not just a uh, command, it is also an invitation and a privilege. I want to share two prayer requests with you this morning before I read some of the scripture and share in prayer with you. Two different individuals that are in our church family or extended church family specifically ask for prayer today. One is Charlie Judd. You know that he had surgery a few weeks ago and then was in and out of the hospital with the coronavirus. And um, it, he just has a long recovery and they asked specifically for prayer today. So remember Charlie Judd. And then also um, Donald Faulkner, J. Don Faulkner, many of you know him by that name. He and his brothers grew up in this community, active part of this church for a long time. Um, he is um, in the hospital in South Florida. And I spoke with him on the phone today, and he would very much request your prayers. He, you know that he's had several ongoing health concerns. So we want to remember J. Don. As I mentioned those two names, you probably have others that come to your mind. And so um, we'll pray for those in just a few moments. Let me read this scripture from Isaiah, the 40th chapter. <clears throat> that chapter begins with the comfort, O comfort my people. And here I want to read the closing verses of the chapter. Have you not known, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. God, he gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youths will faint and be weary and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Won't you join me for a moment of prayer? Gracious God, in these moments, we lift up these individuals to you. And there are others on our minds and in our hearts and in this community who need your attention. And we just ask for your mercy and grace in their lives. There's a lot of weariness in our heart, in our minds, in our souls. There's a lot of tiredness. There is faint. There is powerlessness. And Lord, in those places, we ask that you would give us the wherewithal to turn to you. We ask that you would help us to be, as your followers, be examples to those who are weary, that in our turning to you for strength and guidance, that it would be an encouragement to someone else. We do wonder what it would look like if our love spilled over every day of the year and we recognize that you have loved us so lavishly. You've loved us in times and places when we have not felt deserving at all. And so I ask that you would help us to share that love in whatever way we might. Lord, we 
are amazed at your presence in this world and in our lives. When we think about history, when we think about this place, when we think about our community, we marvel at your presence and your power. And so, Lord, I ask that you would guide us as we seek to follow you faithfully with what we have. And we pray together as Jesus has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Yeah.
Oftentimes, this passage is one that encourages us to keep on keeping on. So if you need that encouragement today, maybe you're in the right spot. Let's, let's pray together. Lord, you are our light and our salvation. Whom shall we fear? You are the stronghold of our lives. Of whom shall we be afraid? You are our refuge and strength. You are the always present help in times of trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. So create in us a clean heart, O God. Renew your right spirit within us. And may the word of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to you. Lord, our rock and our redeemer. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. So, there are a lot of ways that you can be tired. A lot of ways to be tired. Raise your hand if any of those ways are affecting you at this moment. We can be honest here. <laughs> One of the ways to be tired is just physical tiredness, right? I remember when I was younger going with a group of friends to ski at Paoli Peaks in Indiana. I lived in Louisville at the time, and a group of us were going to, to ski at this place we'd never been before. Now, it, it's called Paoli Peaks. It probably the more accurate name is Paoli Peak, singular. But anyway, we wanted to check it out, and so we ended up leaving at the crack of dawn and driving the one hour into southern Indiana to see the peak there in the middle of the cornfield. And we skied all day. Started, we were the first ones on the slope, first lift ride up, and we skied until the end of the day and were exhausted on the way home. I looked it up this week. It's only 49 miles from where we lived. There were four of us who went, and all of us took at least one turn driving home. That's how tired we were. <laughs> four people driving 49 miles. I remember pulling into the parking lot at Southern Seminary at the bottom of the hill, which meant the apartment I lived in was less than 400 meters away. And I remember saying, guys, somebody's going to have to take a turn. I, think, I don't think I can make it all the way home. And they said, Andy, it's 400 meters. <laughs> so just complete physical exhaustion. And I remember stumbling into the apartment and falling onto the bed, and I think I fell asleep on top of the sheets and covers without, you know, not even getting in, and didn't move until the next day. That's one kind of tired. Have you ever been that physically tired? Yeah, when you're that physically tired, what cures it? A night or two of, of sleep, right? Maybe a really good night's sleep. The next day, all of a sudden, everything's better. But that's only one kind of tiredness. You know, there are lots of kinds of tiredness, and some of those tirednesses lead to weariness, I remember hearing this when we had children, that here's what describes raising children. The days are long, but the years are short. I don't know if you've experienced that or remember it or have seen it. And you can just get bone tired. You know, who'd have thought following a toddler around all day would just absolutely kill you? But it can. We can get tired from that. We can get tired from the challenges on our physical body. I have a close friend who, over a Christmas season, spent time in the hospital in Hickory, North Carolina. Then they transferred him to Asheville, North Carolina. Then they transferred him back to Morganton, North Carolina. And I saw him, I think in all three places probably, but in Morganton I said, Hey, how are you doing? And he said, You know, I'm sick and tired. And, I, and he said, And I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. <laughs> Have you ever felt that way? Yeah, that's a kind of weariness. You can be tired and weary from taking care of somebody. You can be tired and weary from work. Maybe you have expectations placed upon you that it, it's hard to meet. Or maybe someone doesn't quite understand the challenges before you. Or maybe you're not appreciated for the job that you do. And so you get weary, you know. We've experienced some weariness this last year. I remember in this place... When, we, when the coronavirus started hitting, I remember saying, you know, I get a feeling this is going to be more like a marathon than a sprint. And then a friend of mine was telling me, well, here's how the joke went. It was not a sprint. It was not a marathon. Midway through the marathon, they said, oh, by the way, this is an ultra. And then you're running the ultra marathon. Then they said, oh, yeah, and at the end, there's a bike and a swim. I don't know where we are, but, man, it gets weary. It gets tiring, does it not? Maybe you have been weary 
and you have been tired because if you, as you've looked out in this world and seen the challenges over this last year, you've been so disheartened at the way we have responded. And your neighbors and your friends and even your family, and you're just heartbroken. You're like, gosh, this has brought out the worst in us. I'm just weary. I'm just tired. You know? There are all kinds of tiredness and all kinds of weariness. And, and maybe you feel some of any of those today. And if you do, if you, if you do, you're, you're in a good place. Because these verses that the prophet Isaiah wrote remind us about someone who doesn't faint and about someone who doesn't get tired and someone who doesn't get weary. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God. He is the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. There is somebody who doesn't get tired no matter what the challenge happens to be. The one who created this whole world, this whole universe. When these words were spoken, when these words were written, they were, writ they were written to a people who were just really tired. The Israelites who were in exile, they had been dragged from their homes. For many, many years, they had to live in a strange land. And, and when they were taken from their homes, the way that they were removed, the people who were the doctors and lawyers and Indian chiefs were taken, the people who could build things, who could figure out things, who could teach things, who could understand things, they were taken. Everything else was left in ruins. And when they were taken away, they, could, they were allowed to worship. They were allowed to group together in their groups. But there was always someone from outside watching closely. And, and, and the Israelites were not able, to, not able to develop too much power. And they always wondered, will we ever, you know, Jerusalem is in ruins. Will we ever know military or political clout again? And during this time, not to belabor the point, but through all of history, people have fought with each other, nations with each other, ethnicities with each other, different geographical locations. During this time, more than probably any other time, an argument between nations was an argument between gods. And so when these Israelites were in exile, and when they feel alone and afraid, and they see their enemies stronger than they are, they wonder, God, do you hear us? God, do you, do you know we're okay? God, will you make things right? God, do you understand the needs of little old me? wonder if you've ever felt that way before. In a place of tiredness or powerlessness or discouragement, God, can, do you remember little old me? A friend of mine is an amateur astronomer, and he has this fancy schmancy telescope that he brings out of his house and puts outside to view the stars. And it has a motor on it so you can see, you know, you can track things across the sky. They're really moving, or we are, or both. You know, you know more about science probably than I do. But I remember looking in his telescope, and I mean, I'm serious. You could see Jupiter, and you could tell that's Jupiter. I can see the way it looks. And you look at the telescope, and you can see Saturn, and you can see the rings on Saturn, not in a book, through that lens. And you can see the moons. And, and, and we're out there looking in this beautiful sky outside of Charlottesville, Virginia. And he said, you know, on my best days, I recognize that the creator of this universe is the God we serve. And the God we worship, the one who put this all together. He said, but on my worst days, I wonder, can God remember little old me? <laughs> Does God remember little old me? Have you ever wondered that? That's probably the way many of these Israelites felt far from home, in exile, wondering, God, do you remember little old us? Well, we've seen many examples, but one is when God sent His Son, Jesus, to bear testimony here on this earth. In Mark chapter 5, there was somebody who wondered, does anybody notice my plight? Jesus' fame was growing. People were being drawn to Him. They were drawing in on Him. And in Mark chapter 5, the leader, one of the leaders of the synagogue came to Jesus and said, Hey, my daughter is sick. Will you please come to our house? And will you please touch her and heal her and take care of her? And so Jesus started making his way there. This is one shot of what's going on. And as he's making his way to the synagogue, I mean, excuse me, to the leader's house, as he's making his way, people are kind of crowding in on him because they want to hear what he has to say. They want, to, they want him to touch um, 
they want him to touch them. They, they want to get, the, get a piece of this Jesus. And all of a sudden, he feels somebody touch his garment. And he stops. And he says, who touched the hem of my garment? And his disciples wondered, Jesus, look at this huge crowd of people. How in the world can you tell somebody touched your garment? How are we going to ever identify it? That's one thing that's going on. But here's the other thing that was going on. There was a lady who for 12 years had what Scripture calls an issue of blood. She was bleeding. She had tried everything she knew to try. And during this time, um, more than now, you're, any kind of physical malady that you struggled with indicated that there was some kind of some kind of spiritual malady and so people had to wonder well I know she's sick she looks like everything's okay but I wonder what she's doing that's caused this to happen and when it had to do with blood she is ostracized from her family and ostracized from worship and ostracized from the community she is somebody who has to wonder does anybody understand how I feel for 12 years spent all of her money tried everything she knew to try and then she heard Jesus was coming to town and she thought, if I can just touch the hem of his robe, that'll be enough. And so she did. And Jesus said, who touched me? And she fessed up. And he said, woman, your faith has made you whole. Go and be healed. Does anybody care about my situation? Little old me in this big old world. Jesus said, who touched me? Woman, your faith has made you well. Have you ever wondered, does anybody care about little old me? That had to be the way the Israelites were feeling. What do you do? Where do you turn when you're tired and when you're weary? I had a close friend who worked in, in Richmond, Virginia, when we lived in Virginia. And we had planned for me to come down and maybe have lunch with him or something when, on, on a day off. And he said, well, I've got an idea. Here's, here's what we need to do. Bring a sandwich, meet me at my office, we'll eat a sandwich, and then I want to take you to this coffee shop right down the road. Um, I want to take you to this coffee shop right down the road. And so I said, oh, okay, you know, and so I, it was the strangest thing. I show up at his office, you know, with my brown bag, and he says, well, sit down, and we hurriedly eat our sandwiches real quickly, and then we take off for the coffee shop. Now, we were both young, married people. I don't think either one of us had kids at the time. And money was kind of tight. We were in school. Our wives were in school. You know, all this kind of stuff. You know, those kind of times in life when you used to be able to put the electric check in the water bill and buy yourself a few days. <laughs> did anybody have to do something like that? Nowadays, it doesn't work that way. But then it did. And see, so, so he said, well, here's the thing. He said, I can't afford to drink good coffee and eat lunch every day you know, go get a, get a lunch. But if I pack my lunch, I can get good coffee every day. And so I take a daily retreat to this coffee shop. Knew the barista, knew the people in there. He said, I said, oh, really? He said, yeah. And so I either invite a close friend to join me, or I sit quietly, or I pray, or I think about things. But every day I take this retreat. He said, you know, if I can, it can be crazy in the morning. When I take this little retreat, all of a sudden things are different. I'm not tired anymore. A new lease on life. You know, and I thought, wow. And so he invited me to his little retreat. And since then, I have thought about the power of those kind of rituals. Maybe you have them. Maybe there's a cup of coffee or a place in your house or a, a, a scripture that you turn to or a favorite chair or a window you like to look out. And every day, that helps you keep your sanity. And you take a few moments to just think about God and about life and about this world and to offer up prayer perhaps where do you turn where do you turn when you're weary or you're tired um, I read an interesting biography about, about Martin Luther King Jr. and it was just this powerful biography that told of the highs of his life and the lows and painted a vivid picture of both. But there was one time that just really jumped out at me, and I want to read you just an excerpt. Martin Luther King had gone to Montgomery 
And he was there with his wife and his family. And, he, and they had settled into bed after a long, strenuous day. Coretta had already fallen asleep. And just as I was about to doze off, the telephone rang. And on the end of the line, there was this angry voice who cursed at him, called him a bad name. You can perhaps imagine what it was. And he said to him, We've taken all we want from you. Before next week, you'll be sorry you ever came to Montgomery, Alabama. And so here's what Martin Luther King Jr. said. He said, I hung up, but I couldn't sleep. It seemed that all of my fears had come down on me at once. I had reached a saturation point. I got out of bed and began to walk the floor. Finally, I went to the kitchen and heated a pot of coffee. I was ready to give up. With my cup of coffee sitting untouched before me, I tried to think of a way to move out of the picture without appearing a coward. Trying to figure out a way to get out of this without looking like a coward. In this state of exhaustion, when my courage had all but gone, I decided to take my problem to God. With my head in my hands, I bowed over the kitchen table and I prayed aloud. The words I spoke to God that midnight are still vivid in my memory. I am here taking a stand for what I believe is right, but now I am afraid. The people are looking to me for leadership, and if I stand before them without strength and courage, they too will falter. I'm at the end of my powers. I have nothing left. I've come to the point where I cannot face it alone. And he said, at that moment, I experienced the presence of God as I never had experienced him before. And in that moment of weariness, in that moment of weakness, in that moment of being tired, in that moment of growing faint, he felt God's strength that encouraged him to carry on. Where will you turn when you get tired or when you're weary? Where will you turn? The prophet Isaiah wants to remind his peers, and remind you and me that there is someone who doesn't grow weary or faint. Someone doesn't get tired. In that chapter, six different times, Isaiah asked the question, Have you not heard? Have you not known? Do you not remember? Didn't you see? Don't you understand? God gives power to the faint. God strengthens the powerless. Even youth will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted, even though they don't realize it. That's my addition. Even though we don't realize it, excuse me. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. That is the good news today. Do you wonder if anyone notices or anyone knows? God does. The creator of the universe has his eye on politics, capital P, little p. He sees the nations, he understands the world, he sees the people, and he sees you and me. And when you are tired, and when you are weary, and when that has grown into discouragement and dismay, and you just feel like you're out of gas, that's the one to whom you can turn. Jesus said it this way, come to me. Come to me, all you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens. Come to me, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. Come to me, Jesus said. And that invitation is good today. Maybe if you're tired this morning, the first thing you need is a good night's sleep. Okay? But maybe... Maybe the tiredness is a little bit deeper. And the only solution and the only answer is God, the creator of the world. Have you not known? Have you not heard? He doesn't faint and he doesn't grow weary. We can come to him. Let's pray together. Lord, in these moments, you know our hearts, you know our needs. You know the challenges that we face. I ask, Lord, that you would guide each person in this room to respond to your goodness. Lord, we need your help and your strength in our lives. We need 
your touch in those places where we're discouraged. We need your strength in the places where we're carrying heavy burdens. And so I ask, Lord, that you would come to us in a way that we might understand and we might respond. And I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As we, I'll invite praise first to come. As we come to a conclusion time of the service, if there is some kind of decision that you would like to make, use this time. If you would like to speak to me or someone else afterwards, we'll linger. If you need to make some kind of decision in a public way, um, we're going to sing a portion of one of the songs that we sang um, that reminds us about God's sacrifice in Jesus for for us, and so if you need to respond, use this time. But I do want to say that the invitation isn't just open for the last five minutes of the service. It's always appropriate to respond to God's invitation in your life. And so if you need help articulating that, please, please come to me or to someone else. Um, we're going to sing the concluding portion of Oh the Blood. Oh, what love, no greater love, grace, how can it be, that in my sin, yes, even then. Thank you so much for joining in worship today. And whether you're in this room or whether you're watching later online, we're so glad that you're part of this fellowship. Um, as we conclude, I want to, um, normally I would end the service with a, some kind of blessing. I have several that you've grown to know through the years. One of them is found in, num in the book of Numbers, and it's called a, a priestly blessing. And for literally hundreds and hundreds of years, assemblies have been um, ended with this, this blessing, and we want to share it with you today in a, um, in a musical form. So um, this will be our closing benediction, the blessing. Make it.
his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face.